Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sri Zaheer, Dean of the Carlson School of Management, and welcome to First Tuesday. Today, we're join, joined by Jean Crane, and I've gotten to know Jean very well in our time together serving on the Federal Reserve Bank Board of Directors. And I'm so delighted to see quite a few of my, our Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis colleagues out here. We, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see you all coming here to support the directors. And we have with us uh, also a very special guest, the president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank. I, you know, please don't blame us for anything that's happening with your stock portfolios, but, <laughs> but anyway, it's, um, it's wonderful to have Neil, President Neil Kashkari here, so thank you for coming. And of course, a very, very special thank you to the many Carlson School of Management and University of Minnesota supporters in our audience here today. And, uh, you know, particularly, you know, just, uh, and I want to, you know, recognize our longstanding corporate sponsors, our, uh, which, which, are, which is Wells Fargo and Twin Cities Business. So thank you for your support. I mean, this uh, first Tuesday has been running now, I think, for 27 or 28 years, and we couldn't do it without all the uh, support that we get from our sponsors. So now I'm honored to introduce today's speaker, Jean Crane. Jean is the president and CEO of Bremer Financial Corporation, which is a $16 billion financial services organization. Since becoming CEO in 2016, Jean has combined her extensive industry knowledge with decades of leadership experience to advance the company's strategy and performance, champion Bremer's vision, mission and values, and deliver on its commitment to help communities thrive. So as an active volunteer and community leader, Jean serves on the board of Autotail Corporation, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, the YMC of the North, the St. Paul Downtown Alliance, and the Minnesota Business Partnership. She earned an MBA from Marquette University, we'll forgive her for that, and has a bachelor's degree from a sister school, the University of North Dakota. And in 2018, she was the recipient of the Sioux Award, which is the highest honor given by the University of North Dakota's Alumni Association and Foundation for, uh, and foundation for her achievements, for her service, and for her loyalty to the school. And Jean was also recently recognized by the American banker, by American banker as a woman to watch as part of their 2020 Most Powerful Women in Finance. I love that. And uh, in recognition, and also by the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal as one of their 2019 Most Admired CEOs. So please join me in welcoming Jean Crane. <laughs> see, I shouldn't trip and fall out here, so. <laughs> Thank you, Sri. Well, Jean, it's just wonderful to have you here. And maybe we can start the conversation. We're gonna have a, a, a conversation for a little while and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And maybe we'll start with, you know, I'd love to get a little bit of a sense of, you know, what brought you here? What's your background like? I know you grew up in North Dakota, but what has stayed with you from your early years? Is that some, you know, are there some lessons that from that time that still have carried you through to this day? Well, thanks, Shri, and it's so good to be here. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to be part of this conversation with you. Yeah, I did grow up in central North Dakota, a very small uh, town, about 2,500 people, rugby, if any of you are familiar with it. It is, this, it is the center of the universe, we call it. It's the center of the North American continent geographically. But, um, you know, I, I grew up uh, in a family that uh, my, my parents were, you know, business owners. They were hardworking individuals. They, I think, instilled in their children a set of values and expectations. Education was really important, and and uh, giving back to community was important. I had, uh, I have, I have seven siblings. So I guess that was really the first team that I was ever a part of. Um, <laughs> I've got uh, six sisters and one brother, and. And uh, again, people that, uh, you know, that are still my rock in many ways. I would say that you know, we're all very different, have different talents, different interests, um, but we're very close-knit. And, and uh, I think I've carried a lot of that with me, that just sense of, of, of values and um, the importance of, of how you work with, with individuals and people to, to, uh, 
to get to where you want to go. That's that's great. I mean, to you know, to have those values and you know embedded in you right from your family. That's fantastic. And it's just um, you know, you've been now CEO of Bremer, I guess, for seven years practically, almost Going seven on years. Seven years, yeah. Seven years, and uh, you know. Did you sort of anticipate how things were going to be when you came in? How have things changed since you know since you first took over? Yeah, well, no, I I, I don't know that you ever really know what yeah. to anticipate yeah. taking yeah. on on a leadership role where you really do have the responsibility of of guiding and inspiring and leading a team of individuals. But it is work that I love that I'm passionate about. I, was, I would say that I, I was attracted, I've been at Bremer now um, just almost 11 years, and I've been CEO since the very end of 2016. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it, it, it's, it's just such an opportunity to continue to understand how you make impact as an individual, and that's what's always been most important to me. So when I look back at what we've covered in the last six to seven years, we've covered a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, think what I, what I think what was most important for us over that course of time was really coming together as a one Bremer team, as we call it. And, and to shed a little bit of light on that, we were an organization that for decades had been nine different uh, charters, um, nine different boards of directors, uh, essentially nine different institutions, depending on the leadership and the, uh, the interest of that leader and the geography that they were in. So we spent a lot of time initially as I got into the role um, in the early part of 2017, putting in motion, working with the executive team, putting in motion a cohesive strategy to drive the organization forward because we weren't leveraging the collective strengths of this amazing organization. And so we spent a lot of time on that, and we actually ended up positioning ourselves very visibly as a commercial and agricultural bank, which is, is what we are. I mean, if you look at our, our balance sheet, 80% of our loans and greater are um, to the ag and commercial sectors. And so we, but we haven't said that. We were quiet about that. We weren't willing to really uh, define that for a, a variety of different reasons. So we put in motion a strategic plan. We defined our priorities. We built that around the customer. So we put the customer at the center of that work. We started um, applying resource allocation uh, more on impact versus being trying to be fair about that. And I think the most exciting part of that work, when I think back to uh, what we did in, in early 17, again, because we, we were these, these um, very separate and independent organizations, we really challenged ourselves to define our, our company purpose. And, um, and that was really important for us to understand when you come together as an organization, how do you build on what you're, what, who you are and what you're trying to do. And we were very introspective about that work. We started it in early 17, and we didn't reveal it until um, kind of May of 2019. And I think the thing I'm most proud about that work is we, we started by looking at um, who we are and, and, and what were our differentiators, what were our key foundational strengths, mm -hmm. and then leverage that. We didn't start with the visual uh, look of our brand, okay. which was tired and old and needed to be changed. There were many of us who recognized that um, far before I was for C, uh, CEO. But uh, we started that work in early 17, we revealed it in 19, and, and we stated our corporate purpose very simplistically as cultivating thriving communities, because that's what we are all about. We, we defined our values as being collaborative, committed, and, and creative. And we defined our, 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 uh, our promise to our customers at that time by talking about how we wanted to work together as a team to, to create more opportunities to offer a better experience to our customers. And, and that was who we were and what we were doing, but we, we, weren't, we just didn't have that at the forefront. Um, and so we, we created that. We, I think, had an opportunity to really um, provide a better view of, of all these strengths that we had for the benefit not only of our customers, the marketplace, but for our employees as well. And so we covered a lot of ground in those you know, first wow. few years. Wow, that sounds like a lot, really, to try and bring the, you know, these nine organizations together as one Bremer and to identify the strengths and articulate them. And I think that's uh, just a wonderful thing that you've done. And I mean, did the, how did the pandemic affect any of that? Did it sort of 
you know, I know you've just in 2019, you've suddenly come out with your new strategic plan, you've got your purpose well defined, and then, you know, the world changes. How did that hit yeah. you, or were there any lessons yeah, that you well, learned from that? Oh my gosh, we, I think we all, <laughs> the whole world learned a lot from that. I, I mean, I think we learned that we could be very flexible, um, we could be adaptable, agile, and boy, we were focused in ways that I have never seen in my career. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I think that was particularly important. I actually was in an interesting conversation last week with a, a customer of ours who also, his business is the business of, of business strategy. Okay. And we were talking about um, the word pivot. And it was kind of interesting because um, we, we were talking about this, how we pivoted. And he, and he kind of reacted to that. And he said, gosh, if anybody here knows the the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the game of basketball, mm -hmm. when you pivot, you pivot off of your strong leg, right? You don't, you don't, you know, so when you go in a new direction, you're starting from a position of strength to make that change. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, I'm like, it really resonated with me because when we um, were faced with, the early, especially in the early days of the pandemic, mm -hmm. we all pivoted. But when I think about that, the way we were able to do what we did was because it was from a position of strength. We, we cared about our communities, we cared about our customers and non-customers alike. So when, when the government passed um, you know, the CARES Act and we became that agent to extend PPP loans, we, we took 25% of our workforce and we put them fully dedicated on that effort. We built a manual process to make that happen. We weren't gonna wait for a technology solution to do wow. that. And that meant the other 75% of the workforce had to pick up the work that others were not doing any longer. But we did that from a, a position of strength, and in the end, we were one of the you know the top lenders in the state for PPP. We Fantastic. we uh, we extended over 12,000 loans. We did about two billion in volume. And I think the the thing that we're most proud of as a team is that we kept 170,000 people on payrolls. And so we're really proud of that work, but we, we, you know, we did it because we had the ability uh, to quickly focus as a team on, on how this was so important for our communities. But I think the other thing when you talk about you know, learning from the pandemic, I also think we, we really learned about you, know, you can't control these external events, right? There's just no way. And now, now we have an uncertain economy and you know, extraordinary inflation that the Fed is working hard to to try to manage, but as, as we think about that, that economic uncertainty, uncertainty we're going through right now, we can apply a lot of those lessons learned from the pandemic. You, you can only control uh, your own determinants of success, right? And so we really uh, decided that uh, we wanted to lean into our relationship management strategy. We wanted to define these foundational strengths of the organization mm -hmm. and then advance those. But we also knew the world was changing pretty rapidly. And one thing that uh, we challenged ourselves to do when the calendar turned to 2021 um, we, we, we took on a whole organizational endeavor mm. to say, we're gonna be better. And this is, this, this is hard to tell an organization because we, we had top performance, we had record performance in, in the last number of years, we were operating really well, but, you can, but when you take away what you learned and how, how you can advance and accelerate your work, there's no, there's no way the world is stopping in terms of the changes happening. Right. Right. So to prevent you know, yourselves from being disrupted, it's always about how you disrupt yourself. And so what we challenged ourselves to do was really take a look at these foundational strengths, but you know, how can we be a better organization? And we put in motion mm -hmm. this, uh, this, this organizational work to, um, we, we actually, it was, it was designed as we have these seven major work streams okay. that were all had executive leadership sponsorship from our executive team. Mm -hmm. uh, we had more than 60 plus individuals from across the company working in very new and cross-functional ways. Mm -hmm. And we had a number of initiatives within each of those work streams. And it was all of that was focused on what's impeding our performance. Mm -hmm. Okay. and how can we drive our growth. And we just, so we kind of took a microscopic look at what we were doing, how we were doing it, and really determined that we can uh, really advance and, and heighten our, it was all about accelerating and heightening our performance to new and better levels, to come out of this, this, 
really challenging time as a stronger organization. So I'm really proud of the work that we did as a team um, during the pandemic to really take on new work to advance yes. and understand uh, how we could be better stewards of this company. That's amazing because, you know, I think one of the things that I hear from CEOs all the time is that post pandemic, one of the most difficult things has been to sort of um, recreate the sense of community and culture within their organizations. And, you know, you started off as nine different organizations. You had just about gotten everybody together with this one Bremer situation. And then you get into the pandemic and you're, re you know, you reframing everything. How did you, you know, what are you doing once, now that you're out, now we're out of those, that period, hopefully, you know, yeah. you know and, um, and, and we're getting to a point where we're thinking about how do we rebuild community, how do we rebuild, rebuild culture in the organization? Is there something you did? Because you seem to have taken on even more as we yeah. we're coming out. So how, how, did that, how did you make that happen? It's a lot of, a lot of change management, but I, I love that you're asking about culture because it's so important. And right. I think we, you know, we've all worked in such disjointed and different ways. People have their own preferences of how they want to work. But culture is, is really important. And I think if you don't actually pay attention to it and manage it, it can, it can go off in different directions and maybe a direction that you don't want it to go to. So you got to pay attention to it. I think just like everything else, you have to manage it. I think I would say that we are a culturally rich organization and I'm really proud of that. We have, uh, we, we pay a lot of attention in terms of uh, what's important to our customers, what's important to our team and developing our team and advancing our success, uh, at, you know, leveraging the collective whole. Right. So we, we, we've recently made a decision that we want to bring our teammates back for three days a week. And, uh, and so we're working through, there's a lot of change management with that, but, but we also want to retain our culture. It's allowed us to flourish for years uh, by, by being together. And I think that's just a really key ingredient. I think the thing you're missing sometimes is uh, when, you, when you think about the Zoom meetings or the Teams meetings that we all have and, and still will have, uh, you don't have that serendipity of running into people and, and talking and just building relationships and having uh, those that creative juice flow just because you get into a conversation. So we're, we're trying to manage that. We're trying to be um, stepping forward in that. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be flexible. It doesn't mean we're not still offering a hybrid opportunity. We know well, there's some really good things that came out of that uh, foray into you know, remote work, right? right? So we have every opportunity to continue to be flexible in how we do it, but it's really important we've decided to have uh, to be together more than not. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, when I think about some of the work we're doing in, in some of the specific initiatives, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a particularly important uh, initiative endeavor for us, and we have, um, you know, when we think about our current workforce, you think about how we show up in the marketplace and how we meet the needs of our customers. Um, I, I just am a firm believer that it's really important for us to spend some time together in mentoring and in, in attracting talent and in, in that building that sense of belonging. Sure. And, and so we paid a lot of attention to that. And, and it's, it's not easy work, but it's work that we're willing to do because we think it's really a critical part of how we preserve uh, you know, this, this opportunity for us to be successful, uh, as successful as we have been based on our cultural, um, our, our emphasis on that aspect of who we are. Right. No, I think I love this intentionality and trying to sort of pay attention to culture very specifically. And, uh, you know, you're absolutely right about how, you know, as we look for talent, you know, we have to make sure that everybody we hire feels that sense of belonging. And I think that's a very important part of the retention, yes. you know, and uh, being able to develop talent as well. No, this is, um, you know, <clears throat> maybe at this point we'll look a little bit to the future, you know, you're telling us a little bit about what's happened with Bremer so far. I know, you know, the world of finance is changing with all of the digital technologies and fintech and whatever. I just heard Jay Powell this morning saying that crypto needs to be regulated, so <laughs> that's, that was good to hear. But, you know, how, are you, how is Bremer positioning itself for the future? What are you thinking about what you might do in terms of strategy, in terms of uh, investments that you might make? Well, yeah, there's, a, there's so much going on in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. 
kind of thematically. I think we, we, so we're in the process right now. We have been in this cadence of re, uh, renewing our strategic plan every three years. So we started one in 17. We refreshed it in 20. And again, really emphasizing our priorities as an organization. So we are doing that again right now. And we're st certainly focused on uh, what's important for us on the short term. But we're also, at this point in time, looking at how, because there's so much change going on, and you know, I kind of look at it as the digital revolution more than anything. You know, you like think of the industrial revolution, revolution, and what that uh, led to, and that's you know, that's been happening for a decade plus in our industry. But it's really important for us to understand how we look at you know what's happening in the industry as we start this endeavor of updating our strategic plan. And, and I think it's really important for us to focus on how we really set the vision or kind of sh at least shape our vision for the next decade mm -hmm. of growth. And so we have, you know, when, we, when you look at the industry, there's a lot of new non-bank competition. Sure. There is um, ability to partner with fin fintechs in a way. Um, there's, new, there's new business models out there. There's, um, you know, new talent models. There's uh, employee expectation. There's this inflection point with, uh, with what's happening in digital. There's a huge emergence right now in banking in terms of paying attention to ESG. So thematically, we're, we're, we're considering all of that when we think about how do we grow, how do we, um, you know, how do we manage our, our business from a cost structure standpoint, how do we manage our risk? So we're, we're, we're trying to pay attention to all those, all, all those different pieces. And again, trying to do it in a way that's right for us, right mm -hmm. for our customer base. Right. And, um, in, and, uh, and I think, so when, when, I, when I think about some of this, I think there's such an opportunity to innovate right now. And, and innovation can take all kinds of forms, right? It, 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 it can be the fact we, we re-segmented um, around our business from a geographic structure to a client-centric you know, structure recently. That was big, hard work organizationally, but it made sense because we advanced that, that strategic plan that we put back in 17 that would put the customer at the center. Now we organized ourselves to really put the customer front and center at what we were doing. And that, again, that was a lot of change management. But we, um, we have, have, have really focused on what it means to, um, again, to be that relationship bank, to lean into our strengths, our differentiators, to drive us forward. And so, and we're, so we're looking at new revenue streams. We're looking at some of the, you know, the regulatory expectations, how to automate, how to, um, you know, um, organize ourselves. So that whole opportunity to innovate I think is, is really critical, important. At the same time, you gotta pay attention to your, to your core business. And I actually came across a term recently that I really loved, and maybe it's because I'm the mom of three left-handed sons. But, uh, <laughs> but it talked about being an ambidextrous leader. And so that really kind of resonated with me because the world is still built over here for largely for right-handed people. But you can be, you know, you can be agile. You have to defend your core business opportunity, but you also have to innovate because if you get behind or you're only focused on trying to prevent the downside, right. you will fall behind. Yeah, you will right. be disrupted. I always think that the, the best way to avoid disruption is to disrupt yourself. So. And so that's, that's what we've been kind of working on mm -hmm. with the, the, the strategic plan and updating that and, and understanding how we move forward. That's, that's amazing. And, you know, it's a, it's a great lesson for all of us to disrupt yourself before others disrupt you. But, um, you know, I'm thinking back now. I mean, uh, Jean and I were part of a little group of women who used to get together yeah. and, you know, and, and chat occasionally about what's next for us. And this was a long time ago, before she became the CEO. And I remember we kind of encouraged you when the CEO position became Weekend, so I'm, I, mean, I want to take some credit for getting Jean into this. <laughs> this is my <laughs> CEO position. So it was a lot of fun, you know, and uh, we were even sort of trying to give you, you know, dressing advice for what you wear to the interview and things like that. You know, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Anyway, it, it was a tough audience. Yeah, it was it a was tough good. audience. Yeah. That's right. So, but um, uh, you know, so over the years, I mean, you clearly, I mean, what you've done is quite amazing in terms of the organizational change, that even moving, you know, becoming one Brema, then fo again, refocusing on the customer as the center of uh, how you kind of uh, uh, organize yourselves. These are 
difficult change management issues. Uh, what has helped you as a leader? What's been your leadership philosophy? I mean, you mentioned the ambidexterity, but is there, I mean, is there something that uh, all of us can take away from what you have managed to accomplish? Well, you know, for leadership in general, I just, I think it's, I've always regarded it to be a, a privilege to be mm -hmm. a leader. There's a responsibility uh, to make sure that you are, you know, inspiring and, and hoping to, to guide a team to a common purpose I'm passionate about our company purpose, so that, that's kind of easy for me to do. I love what we do. I love the impact that we make. I think we're one of the, we're one of the few privately held mid-sized banks in the country, and we really have an opportunity to deliver uh, to community and make impact in ways that I, I, our whole team believes, and I think we attract talent as a result of that. I mean, clearly it's important to, to be, I think, an authentic person, to uh, to offer communication, and that mostly, and when you say communication, it involves a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. I learned so much uh, from you know paying attention to our team, from hearing uh, what they uh, what, what's concerning to them, um, and you know employee engagement surveys, all of that. Um, as our chief people officer always said, it, it, you get the answers uh, by the, by paying attention to that. I also think it's really important for us to. Um, to make sure that individuals on your team understand how they connect with the company's strategy, so how they can find their, their work important and impactful in the overall organizational work. Mm -hmm. So we spent some real time on, as we defined our company purpose, we also allowed and, and had individuals, encouraged individuals, actually uh, set up a, an opportunity for people to define their own personal purpose to tie that to our company purpose. And I think, again, that's, that's part of how you um, inspire and lead. And, um, you know, mostly I'm, I'm, in, I'm just inspired by the, the, the team that I, I work with every day. I mean, I've, I've got an, a senior executive team that I have the, you know, I get inspired with all the time. We've got a chief diversity, you know, and talent officer here who's, who's taught in just about every continent in the world, right? <laughs> We've got a chief people and culture officer who also runs our program office who's got previous experience in manufacturing and, and big box retail, and that makes it different. We have a, 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 a chief marketing officer that's got deep experience in politics and government, and that's helpful. And we've got a, a sales uh, a sales leader here who wants a significant portion of our revenue who's got just deep experience with a large organization that's all about sales excellence. We've got a, we've got a chief risk officer who's a business owner and very successful. We've got a, a chief technology officer who spent four years on a submarine, and you know, wow. so the teamwork, so I'm inspired by these individuals, and, and I think that allows our organization to thrive and grow as well, and, and I'm equally inspired by people who choose to join us after being at another organization right. for 20 years mm -hmm. and uh, believe in what we're doing, and, and, or someone that's maybe brand new to banking because they just left a job at a coffee shop, but they like interacting with people. So we're, we're all about, and, and really focused on, be, people being attracted to our purpose, our mission, our intent, and, uh, and that's who inspires me. And, and uh, it's really fun, and it's, it's really rewarding to work with individuals that come because of those reasons. Right. And, you know, and I have to say, I have been totally inspired by you because you know, the thoughtfulness with which you sort of, call, you know, one of the things that the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis does is just collect information that we can pass on to the, pass on to the president to take to Washington and you know make decisions and you know your comments are always so thoughtful and so well articulated it's always been a pleasure to sort of learn from you and you know on the board as well so you're an inspiring well, individual that's, too that's Jane. very mutual <laughs> <laughs> anyhow so i think at this point we can open it up to the audience and uh, you know i there probably folks with uh, some yeah amy's there she's got yep. a mic all right, we've got our so first question here Please introduce yourself. Te tell us who you are and ask your question. Ready? It's been a while since I've done this, so I've got to warm up a little. Mark Hughes, uh, and I wanted to ask a, a question, and it, it was this. You've done a lot of good things in the community, such as before your time, the Otto Bremer Foundation. Is that still around? And also, uh, what is it doing? How active is it? And also, we've heard in the tax committee, I, I'm a lobbying attorney at the, at, uh, 
when session's on, when I'm not doing everything else. And we heard in the tax committee that the next six months is going to be a real uh, kind of a rough economy for the state. Now, we're, we're not sure on that because the economy these days, as everybody knows in here, is a day-to-day -day thing. But that's what the forecast was the other day, and I don't know that I'm all happy about that, but that's the way it is. Lastly, before I close out, thanks to whoever that is that spent four months on a submarine for serving our country. I apologize, it was really hard to hear. Here, um, Amy, do you think you could just uh, paraphrase that for us? Okay. The, the crooks to the, I had a twofold question. The one is, before your time, and I don't mean that insulting, there was a thing called the Otto Bremer Foundation. Otto Bremer, part of the Bremer Bank. Is that still active? Oh. And then, in the next six months in the tax committee down at the state, we've heard that the economy is supposed to be uh, a little rough. We hate to hear that because I think the economy is a day-to-day -day thing this, uh, these days. And then we'd like to invite you to a gopher game, see if we can make you a gopher. So he's asking about the Otto Bremer Foundation, okay. and that I think predated you, but is that still available? And then I think we are trying to be, make you a gopher here and inviting you to some football games <laughs> instead of a, a UND. Well, I did have gopher season tickets this past year, so. <laughs> uh, yes. For, for football, yes. My, I, have, uh, I have three sons, two of them who graduated from the, the University of Minnesota and had fabulous experiences here. So I'm, uh, you know, this is a wonderful institution and, you know, amazing, uh, amazing gem in our, in our area. Um, Otto Bremer Trust is the name of the organization. It is our 92% economic as shareholders, so they do own a majority of the financial institution, and yes, they are still around. Um, we, um, you know, they make up that significant part of our ownership. So our success is is really critically important because what we do, in part, is as we make dividends to that particular institution as our owner. Um, it drives their work, and they make grants into the communities in which there are Bremer banks, and we're very proud of that work. So we're, you know, we we feel a, a, a great deal of responsibility to drive our success because of the continued impact it makes, and it, it kind of gets recycled into the community. Um, you know, I think you mentioned something about the next six months being challenging. I'm not sure if I heard it correctly. I apologize, but. You know, yeah, it is, it is uncertain times, but I'll go back to the fact of, you know, we, we're, we always focus on what we can control, and that's why we are very focused on our strategic plan, our initiatives, our growth uh, efforts, and, you know, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll lean into, um, I, I love Jim Collins and The Good to Great, and I know that's kind of an old book now, but it still is so applicable, and, and uh, he always talks about the genius of and, and so you, you have to make sure you're focusing on the challenges and these, these kind of extreme experiences you're going through, but you also have to focus and on profit and on change and on your employees. It's that and, it's that additive and of everything you need to focus on, the things that you can focus on and make a difference in your organization, and that's where we're really putting emphasis today, no matter what the economy um, is, uh, is going to present to us. Thank you. We have a question from our virtual audience, Steve. Yep, can, uh, the question is, you chaired the governor's task force on housing. Can you share the status of that work? Can I, I'm sorry, the last part of that question? The status of the work of the oh, governor's task The status task of that work. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. I um, I did share that work. Co-chaired it with Akua Ellis, and uh, so she was a great partner in that work. And that was really all about identifying the opportunities um, and really defining the gaps, the needs. And there's a there's a. A wonderful report that was issued at the conclusion of that work. It involved a number of different individuals. There were at least 30 plus individuals involved in that work. But what we really identified was the critical need for housing, how housing is such a determinant of success. I think one thing that we really discovered even through the pandemic was um, the, you know, it just laid bare these social inequities that, that are so real in our, in our community. And uh, so that housing task force really, you know, focused on 
how to try to solve some of that. There is a next generation of that work that Ron Feldman, who is here, is co-chairing and uh, uh, from the Federal Reserve is, is part of the work with the task and to drive that work forward. There's a new report that's issued. You know, the idea is initially is to define the problem and to offer solutions and then also to work towards some actionable, uh, you know, some real action in how to make change. So there's, there's, a, there's a continued, you know, there's a lot of work going on. It's a very complex issue. It's one that I think we need to involve um, constituents from around, I mean, it, it's going to involve people from government, from philanthropy, from the business community, from uh, you know, social organizations. I think the collective is how we will really uh, will get to some some kind of meaningful outcomes for that. The ground bake uh, co coalition that's happening right now with the leadership of Tanya Allen is driving a lot of good work there. There's a lot of good work going on, but um, I think I, I'm, I'm proud of that work. It really kind of started uh, the the conversation in terms of how critical this is for the economic viability of our state from a workforce standpoint, from attracting of new business standpoint. It's, it's, it's one of these, again, determinants of successful of kids in school by having a place to sleep. So we have, uh, you know, there, there, again, I'll just refer to the report. There's a lot of great content in there, but there's a next generation of that work that continues to take it forward as well. Thank you for speaking today and all of your great nuggets of wisdom, but I really enjoyed the story you told about how the organization didn't have alignment about there were these nine different organizations in the past. And I was wondering two questions. One, how did you come to the conclusion that alignment was necessary back in 2016? And two, what do you think would have happened had you not had that strength when you came to the pandemic? Such a great question. Um, the alignment was really, I would say, in many ways, driven by the economics of the business. There was, you know, without being able to collective, uh, to, you know, to collectively leverage um, all that each of these, each bank had uh, had a lot of great work going on. But it was they, it was really, really separate institutions. And when they were all, we we did legally combine these organizations a couple years before I became CEO, but they were still operating very independently. And, and, and you know, you, you can about imagine the, the, um, the, you know, the experience for a customer to go from one, one Bremer Bank to another felt very different. The focus on strategy, the opportunity to grow was really limited, and the opportunity to scale was severely limited by not having uh, the, the cohesive you know, design of an organization. So um, had, we, you know, had we still been in that place um, and, and uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, you know, I, you know I, don't, I guess I don't want to think about what happened there, but I, you know, um, again, we were, we were in a great position of strength. I, I think the other thing that was really important about, I talked about the brand, refresh and defining our corporate purpose and promise. Everybody understood that and we came together in such a powerful way to accomplish what we did there. Um, we have this, you know, part of what we did, again, we did this very introspective look at defining who we were before we touched the visuals. But when we touched the visuals, uh, we did that with purposeful intent in terms of designing uh, you know, iconography and a logo that really represented uh, who we are and, and what we were trying to convey. So we, when you see the Bremer B with the line above it, the line above it means we're willing to go above and beyond. It means something to our team. And, and we all understand that and you see that and you just, it instills in you this, you know, kind of an action, a momentum, it's empowering, I think. And that's what we really wanted to do with that brand refresh. If we had not had that, um, you know, again, I think it's, it, it just would have uh, not allowed us to make the impact that we really did in the end with that. So that above and beyond is a good segue into my question. Um, I love stories of organizations who are rewarded for doing the right thing. And it sounds like what you did with the PPP loans and, and focusing on those. I have two neighbors that are small business owners that got Bremer PPP loans and stayed with you. And so my question is, did you quantify that? Could you tell how your growth was attached to that? And secondly, 
in the smaller communities that your footprint reaches, did you see a major impact for focusing on that? I would say, well, can you thank your neighbors for me? That's great. I'm glad they, they uh, yeah, they came to us and then they stayed with us. We've had those opportunities. Um, we, I would say we're still working on those opportunities. Individuals got to know us in, in our capabilities and our solutions. I mean, we have really positioned ourselves as a, as a mid-sized bank. And what that really means is that we've got all the capabilities of the largest institutions to really take care, and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to bank the largest, you know, Fortune 500 companies. But we can, you know, you know, we can, we we have a lot of capacity to lend to very large, large companies or provide provide solutions on the treasury management side or the depository side, and and I think some of those companies learned a lot about us in that process. We were we open we decided, and this was a very early decision, might have been in the first 48 hours of that program, that we're not going to limit it to customers only. We're, we're going who, whoever comes in, we're going to build a queue, first come, first serve, and that's how we went through it. And and uh, and that just felt like you know it wasn't our choice to determine who should get. It was just. We were being, you know, we were this conduit to that particular opportunity that the, uh, that the, you know, the U.S. government made available, and so it's really important for us to just be that good steward. Um, but we're, you know, we're yes. Is it a business opportunity to continue to evaluate and pursue? We do know who we worked with um, in those, you know, in that program that weren't customers, and it's a, um, you know, it's 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 an opportunity for us to continue to, um, you know show our interest and, uh, and hopefully do more with those customers. So I don't know that we've actually measured the success of that yet, but it's something that I would tell you we're very attentive to. Great. Steve's got a question from our online audience. Yes. Uh, you've talked a little bit about your role on the board of directors at the Fed. Can you talk a little bit more about that and maybe share uh, a particular insight or takeaway that you've had from being on that board? Well, sure. Um, you know, work, having the opportunity to work with a president like Neil Kashkari, I mean, it's, it's such an enriching experience. Uh, Tree is the chair of the Minneapolis Fed right now and uh, just an amazing leader. So I often feel like my opportunity to, to be part of, of this, this board of directors for the Minneapolis Federal Reserve is something that I get more out of than I give. But I will say that what I've learned the most and where I do really try to... Um, what, what she, Shri was talking about, when I am a reporting director, I really take that quite seriously. And part of the opportunity that the Fed, I've learned this, really considers the, the, um, all that these, all the, the, the directors can share about their knowledge of what's going on. So the Fed really has an opportunity to reach in every corner of, with, with the 12 banks that exist and with the, the, the board of directors that are, are established for each of these 12 banks and the reporting that goes on, we all go out and we talk to business leaders and we understand what's impacting their business and you know, um, whether that, you know, recently it's been a lot about labor, it's been, it was about supply chain, it was about you know, um, what was in, interfering with uh, their plans for growth or what their expectations were for growth. And, and, and so you, you talk to business leaders that are living this every day and they're experiencing this and you bring that conversation back to the Fed as a reporting director and they really have an opportunity to consider all that. They have a lot of data and a lot of hard work they're doing to understand all that's going on. But to be informed and be interested in really what's happening in real time in the economy by people that are out there creating the economy is something that I discovered is particularly interesting to the leadership at the Fed. And then all of that gets rolled up together and, and is taken uh, you know, into consideration when monetary policies are being determined and, and considered. So it's been an enriching and rewarding experience. Um, the, the, uh, the talent at the Fed is, here in Minneapolis, I gotta tell you, it's just amazing the, the, between the research and all that goes on. Uh, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, just this, this amazing bank that is just doing particularly, I think, impactful work, not only for our own economy and for the Ninth District, but really that, uh, that goes far beyond uh, for, to impact the whole Federal Reserve System. That's right. Neil would like to Amy, do you, can you bring the Sorry, mic? Hold on, Olivia. We'll come back to you. 
sorry to cut in line, but just to, um, to brag about Gene for a second, which I'm not sure most people won't know this. When Congress was first debating, designing a PPP program, they asked for feedback and insight, like how would you design a program that banks could actually use? Gene was one of the people we called. And Gene's team actually provided some feedback that we then provided to Congress and said, it's up to you, Congress, if you want to use this or not, but this is feedback on how a bank could actually operationalize that. And I think that that served the country well. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right, we've got one more question here with Ms. Olivia. Um, I'm Olivia Starr. I'm the Associate Director of the Funds Enterprise at Carlson. So we're a student-run asset management fund, and we really try to support um, individuals and students from historically underrepresented groups in finance and help them be successful. So it was great to hear Shri talk about your women's group who would kind of give each other the courage to go for those C-suite roles. What would you say to women who are looking to get into finance and banking today? Go for it. <laughs> There's so much opportunity. Um, this, this is a, I mean, I've been in this industry for over 40 years now, and, um, and I've stayed in the industry because it's, it's changed. It's offered me so many different avenues of, of growth and, and, and change along the way. It's a, it's a rapidly changing industry. We need more women leaders. We need uh, that diversity of, of thought and uh, in representation, um, you know, in a much bigger way within the industry. So it, it, it's, it's, um, it's always got to be driven, I think, by your own interests and passion. And, and as I said, I think, you know, I've, I've been in this industry a long time. I have found my way, thankfully, uh, to an organization that I would say I've been there 11 years now has been the absolute highlight of my career, and it's and it's in part because of the you know how we define our purpose, the team that we have, um, but it's you know it's mostly the impact that you can make, and and so you find you know as an individual what drives you you know what drives your energy and your interest, and and I you know I, I think there's there's such a variety of, of of people that I interface with between our customers and our employees and. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great career if you like working with people, if you, want, if you like making impact, and, and really understanding, um, I think more than anything that I've learned is we have just such an opportunity and frankly a responsibility as, as a bank within communities to really make a difference, to lean into the needs of the community, certainly by being a first and foremost a successful for-profit banking institution, right? But with that, you can also make real impact in ways um, that, uh, that I think a bank in general has more of an opportunity to do than just about any other industry. So if that's a passion, if that's an interest, um, it's a great opportunity uh, to grow a career. Great, thank you so much. Everyone, can we please give a round of applause yeah. to Jean? Oops, oops. Jean, um, just, I, you know, what you're doing to make communities thrive, I'm really, really impressed by that and so many words of wisdom out there today for all of us to, you know, um, think about. So thank you and, uh, you know, it's, uh, and thank you also to everyone who's joined us today at McNamara. Thank you for being here. I think you'll agree that we've all learned a lot. And I hope you can join us for the next First Tuesday, which is in April, and which will be focused, uh, we'll have a panel here talking about the future of healthcare, another industry that is really important to, this, to our economy right here. And we will be joined by Dr. Jacob Tolar, the Dean of the University of Minnesota Medical School, by Lisa Shannon, who is President and CEO of Alina Health, and Dana Erickson, who is the president and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield. And so we can expect a pretty fascinating discussion. So thank you again. Thank you again for joining us. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week. If, it, you know, it's, if it's easier to drive on campus this week, it's because it's spring break and the students aren't here. 
but drive safely and see you all.